Hello. Awesome. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Um, so super excited to have you all here at Making Worlds Bookstore and Social Center for our awesome discussion around anti-colonial eruptions with the author Gio Ma Maher. Excuse me if I mispronounced that. That was good. Um, super excited um, to have Gio here tonight as um, directly relates into our mission and our vision and our values here at Making Words. We really try to provide a space where we can have discussions around important events that's happening in our world and how we can make change happen in our world, especially things like anti-colonialism, anti-capitalism, how we can bring down the patriarchy. Woo, yeah? Cool. So um, my name is Kayla. I am actually um, one of the staff members here. Started as a volunteer um, recently now, um, part of the staff collective which is super exciting we are a non-profit co-op bookstore so everything that you see here is done by the amazing folks who are volunteering their time and hours and love and resources so we always appreciate y'all coming out to our events to help continue to support us you can also support us through purchasing books which of course you can shop the shelves after the event too we do have some um, books also for sale, the anti-colonial eruptions, which and it is holding up in the back. So we have plenty of copies for sale as well that you can pick up on your way out. We are also running an awesome special um, discount, 30% off of the World Without Police book as well. The hard copy, the hard hardcover copy only though, um, not the paperback, just the hardcover. You can grab that in the back too as well. Um, a couple other housekeeping. The bathroom is right here around, so please, of course, if you need it, help yourself. It's there for you. Um, and we will go ahead and, I think, jump off and get started. Thank you so much. Super excited to have you, Gio. Thank you all for being here. Um, super excited, always excited to be making worlds. I was just here on Wednesday, so this, is, this counts as a wonderful week uh, in, in my life. Um, to be here uh, multiple times. Um, this is a collective space. Please make it a space that you all use collectively. Come, hang out, read books, you know, buy books, um, study. Um, and, you know, we were talking earlier about the work that's gone into this space, the building of the shelves. I put in the floor up there. If you want to check out the floor, it's really nicely done. Um, and, you know, but it's been, uh, you know, a struggle over the past few years to keep a space like this open under COVID and having to turn the corner, uh, you know, I'm hoping that, the, you know, uh, that people will support the space uh, moving forward. Um, <clears throat> it's really great to be here to talk to you all about um, this book, about anti-colonial eruptions, and to do so in particular uh, on the eve of, uh, of another eruption, an impending eruption, uh, if not last night, then tonight, if not tonight, then tomorrow or the next. Um, and if there's a kind of tragic determinism there, um, it's, of course, the pairing of the fact that, you know, white supremacist capitalism creates the conditions of rebellion um, through the, 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 the dehumanization, oppression, extraction, um, that, it, uh, that is its, its raison d'etre, and the, the sort of tragic optimism that people will always resist that condition, will always resist dehumanization, um, and the, the kind of violence that dehumanization uh, exists to make possible, as we've seen um, all too vividly. So I also want to just like take a minute and, and sit with Tyree Nichols a little bit and um, before we sort of shuffle his name into uh, the long and, and seemingly never-ending list of those um, sacrificed to the system. If um, you all want to dig into the police book um, uh, and and think about some of the reasons why uh, what we've seen this week is no surprise, um, why it's the inevitable outgrowth uh, of the system of policing that we uh, have in this country, in this world, um, about how there's no reforming it away. There's no way to fix uh, that systemic of a problem and about how abolition is really the only solution to the question of policing. Um, please feel free to check that book out. Um, but we're here to talk about um, the eruptions in particular. Um, and this is a book um, that began, uh, like many books, with a sort of fascination bordering on obsession. And that's a fascination with the image on the cover, the, the volcano, the volcanic, you know, the volcano in the process of uh, eruption. 
And my fascination began a long time ago with this image, um, and it began with a, uh, a sort of uh, quote by the great historian revolutionary C.L.R. James in The Black Jacobins, who says, the colonists sat or slept at the edge of Vesuvius, and they did not know it until it was too late, right? There was something about colonization in what would then become the free nation of Haiti that blinded the colonizers to what was happening below the surface, below their feet, the subterranean rumbling um, that could or should have been audible to them, but for some reason was not. And that really resonated with me um, from a long time ago. And I think um, one of the reasons for that is that, and I think back to my, uh, my early experience with the shock and the surprise that oppressors exhibit uh, when rebellion breaks out. Um, and my first memory of really thinking about that, I think, was living in Venezuela, which is now, uh, shit, 15, 16, 17 years ago. Um, when, uh, and learning about the great turning point in recent Venezuelan history, a mass rebellion in 1989, where in which the, the poverty inflicted upon the Venezuelan people, the exclusion, the racial and economic exclusion of the poorest, exploded uh, into a rebellion known as the Caracaso, um, whose conditions should have been uh, visible beforehand, M mass poverty, structural adjustment programs uh, imposed by the U.S. and the IMF and the World Bank. And yet the response from elites at that time was shock. How could this have happened? You know, how could we possibly be experiencing this? Um, and the way that this shock is commonly described is through the metaphor of the volcano. And this is really what caught my, uh, my attention. Ferguson erupted, Baltimore erupted, Minneapolis, of course, erupted. And these are my words. If you look at press accounts, if you look at people trying to describe the situation, to rationalize it, to explain it, um, it's often described as volcanic pressure simmering below the surface um, and then breaking kind of suddenly and unpredictably forth. And the question for me is why? Why is this metaphor of the volcano so resonant with resistance, rebellion, particularly uh, resistance and rebellion carried out by the colonized and the racialized of the world. And the answer to that question begins with thinking about what it is that the volcano uh, reflects and represents. A surprise. A sudden emergence of something that was underground, something that was not visible, breaking forth, exploding into visibility. And of course, once we think about it this way, uh, we can't, I think, but be struck by the parallels between the question of the volcano and the volcanic eruption and the description that, for example, the great anti-colonial revolutionary Franz Fanon gave of white supremacy when he described it as creating and generating a zone of non-being. This zone of non-being for Fanon, in other words, the non-existence of the racialized and colonized subject, is also for Fanon located specifically and explicitly in a subterranean space. He describes it as a veritable hell, underground, invisible, um, and, and uh, characterized by the, the absence of existence. And of course, for Fanon, the process of breaking out of this hell is an explosive one, notoriously uh, so. So there's a reason that the volcano becomes a metaphor for describing the emergence, the violent and sudden and you know, shocking emergence from a condition of non-existence and non-being to which uh, colonized and racialized people are subject. But what's doubly peculiar then is the fact that the description of the volcano is usually expressed and put forth by those in power, by the dominant, by the colonizer, by the white uh, supremacist and white subject who is surprised by a condition and a reality that they themselves have created. This is really, for me, what was uh, most interesting in part because I was interested in figuring out what it is that this metaphor is saying, not about the colonized engaging in sudden resistance, which of course, again, makes perfect sense, but about the, the shock expressed by the colonizer. What kind of blindness is being described here? What kind of inability to see um, is being revealed um, by those you know, in deploying the very same metaphor of the, um, of the volcano? The volcano of volcanoes was the Haitian Revolution. And again, routinely described as a volcano by C.L.R. James, by others, um, by the colonizers, um, depicted in 
you know, there's this great pair of paintings uh, by, uh, by a French painter who uh, used the very same methods and, uh, you know, and paint strokes and techniques that he had used to paint um, Mount Etna in eruption to then paint the Haitian rebellion and the Haitian resistance. Um, and this is because, as has been so long described, not only was Haiti a revolution and a rebellion, um, but it was a revolution carried, about, carried out by, by black colonized subjects, right? And for this became the most unthinkable event in, um, in modern history up to that point, and one which was very quickly disavowed and, you know, uh, that, you know, sought to, you know, be invisibilized in, in retrospect. And I think there's something about that re-invisibilization that I want to hang on to um, for a minute. I begin the book by pairing the question and the metaphor uh, of the volcano with Hegel's concept of cunning, the cunning of history, the cunning of reason. This is a little nerdy. We don't you know, necessarily have to spend a lot of time on this. For people that like Hegel, I'm not, I was about to say, I'm not even sure if that's, that includes me, but, uh, but I'm someone who thinks about Hegel a lot. Roughly what, what Hegel meant by the cunning of history was the way in which we see erratic um, and seemingly random uh, events uh, occurring all around us. We see chaos, we see the, the clash of individual wills and passions, and yet for Hegel there's this overarching direction to history toward progress, toward greater self-consciousness, toward better human uh, organization of societies and government. Um, and what I try to argue though is that the, the cunning of decolonization in opposition to this can rest uh, on no such assumptions, right? That history moves in a single direction, that it improves, that it moves toward progress. The idea that history moves forward would be a shock and would be a surprise, I think, to those whose history very concretely has moved backward, very dramatically, whether it's enslaved people, colonized people, whose societies were destroyed, broken up, and subject to uh, European uh, and white uh, power. But there's something in the Hegelian account that's very interesting, right? The ways in which um, these subtle and, you know, individual moments and, and you know, uh, and, and I focus in on uh, someone like Nat Turner, for example, who, um, you know, who you can find resonances of Hegel's form of cunning throughout um, his life, right? There are moments in which Nat Turner runs away and then is called, uh, you know, in his own account is called to return and returns um, only to, to sort of deliver an early death blow to, to the system of, of slavery itself. There's ways in which his own masters are sort of teaching him religious um, faith and doctrine, which becomes key to his understanding of a sort of uh, messianic uh, road to revolution. And all of those resonate with Hegel, but we're thinking about something very different. And it's something that emerges from the cunning of the enslaved and the colonized themselves. Again, if we see the metaphor of the volcano uh, sort of perennially uh, called upon to explain these kinds of rebellions, we see something very similar with cunning. If you look at, there's a very new database, very interesting database of, uh, um, you know, of uh, ads for escaped slaves that you can search and read and read the descriptions and read the accounts and the ways in which slaves are figured in these, um, you know, in these accounts. And the word cunning is throughout, right? And so one of the other questions, one of the other puzzles that I was sort of uh, motivated by was this question of, why are slaves understood as cunning? Why are colonized people understood as cunning? Why are indigenous people in the Americas, North and South, described um, as cunning? And there's a very interesting history to the word cunning, which is originally anchored in the notion of knowledge. It's a general, neutral reference to, um, you know, to knowledge, um, which then very quickly gains a negative valence. And it does so precisely because of this resistance by um, those who were excluded, invisibilized, those who were systematically misunderstood and um, you know, uh, explicitly unknown on purpose and by design um, in these systems of power. And so cunning is a word that then becomes attached to oppressed people, colonized people, enslaved people, because it describes what they do with their sort of sneaky, evasive knowledge to resist systems of power. Again, it reveals a kind of blindness. It reveals an inability to see by those in power, which struck me as, as paradoxical. Now, I formulate this as what I call the, uh, the colonial blind spot. And I begin with what is maybe a, a sort of overused but very well-known and resonant story, which is Benito Sereno by, uh, uh, by Melville. For people that don't know the story, um, it's, a, it's a short story um, based on real events that Melville had been, you know, uh, reading about and that he decided to figure in, in sort of fictional, fictionalized form 
of a, a ship that notices a drifting ship, a slave ship, comes up um, boards to see what's going on. They get on board, um, and, and everything seems to be in order. The white captain is there, the slaves are there, the slaves are um, obeying the orders of the captain, but the captain's acting kind of strangely, and the observer is a little confused, and he said there's tension in the air, he doesn't know exactly what's happening, and why is the sort of, uh, the sort of assistant to the captain, this sort of head slave named Babo, why is he always there and always present? And any, as he's disembarking the ship, um, the white captain sort of jumps overboard, and you suddenly realize that, in fact, the slaves had been in, uh, in revolt. They'd taken over the ship, they'd mutinied, they'd been in control the whole time. And yet they were performing their own submissiveness and performing um, the, the condition which then allowed them to, uh, you know, to fool this, this uh, observer. And the question posed by that book, the question that Melville had in mind was, why could this observer not see what was happening? And the answer is white supremacy, right? He could not imagine that the slaves had been not only in control, but performing and sort of, you know, enacting this entire drama of their own accord and through their own uh, design. This is the colonial uh, blind spot. This structured inability of those in power, especially when that power is formulated racially and colonially, um, to see what it is that they have created. Um, and it's no accident. Um, there's another great passage that, uh, from, this is from Faulkner's Absalom, Absalom. Again, takes place on a Haitian plantation, right? Takes place on the eve of a slave revolt, and it's told through the eyes of the, the, the overseer, the son of the, you know, of the, the owner. And he refers to him as he's saying that he did not know that he, what he wrote upon was a volcano. Hearing the, the air tremble and throb at night with the drums and the chanting and not knowing that it was the heart of the earth itself he heard. And then Faulkner uses a very interesting phrase. He writes, overseeing what he oversaw and not knowing that he was overseeing it. In other words, what he was actually seeing, what he should have been able to see, was not visible to him through this colonial blind spot. I track this blind spot through the sort of history of slave resistance, anti-colonial resistance, um, the ways in which it always emerges. And it's a complicated thing because it, sometimes it's an explicit unseeing, sometimes it's, a, it's something which is clearly seen and understood, but what has to be disavowed. Um, I, I call it uh, on occasion a sort of cognitive dissonance that needs to be managed. Um, and I refer to it in the sort of psychoanalytic terms as a sort of... Uh, um, uh, a manic, you know, a manic disavowal, a sort of process of manic, uh, manically repeating, um, you know, how we understand the system. And specifically, if we're talking about, say, the U.S. slave system, it's this sort of dissonance between the slaves are happy in this patriarchal system, which takes care of them and provides for them, and they don't desire freedom. And on the other hand, the constant and permanent threat of re rebellion, right? Both of these are always present in, in the minds of the masters, uh, a sort of contentedness and an ideology of slavery on the one hand, and then an abject fear and guilty conscience that comes with, um, of course, enslaving people that deep down in a certain way you know are actually uh, human. This dissonance is written into the law, right? Into the way, and this comes out in, in sort of trials for slave insurrection, where you're holding people accountable and responsible as legal subjects who you claim in other legal ways, are incapable of being legal subjects, right? Incapable of desiring freedom and incapable of being held responsible, therefore, for what it is that they do. So you find this dissonance throughout history. And you find the ways in which um, it emerges, becomes obvious, and then is uh, uh, disavowed. And paradoxically, you find the sort of ideology, for example, of the U.S. slave system becoming stronger and more often repeated and insisted upon the more resistance there is, right? The, you know, the more impossible it is to deny that enslaved people want freedom, the more the system has to double down on the ideology and repeat it and insist upon it. And so you get these moments historically, you're like, well, uh, you know, after the Haitian Revolution, slave masters are shitting themselves. They're so fucking scared. And yet they repeat over and over again that their slaves would never do this. Then you, after Nat Turner, after Demarc Basie, after all these re rebellions, when you'd think it would become clearer and clearer, it becomes in fact less clear. And I'm sort of, you know, emphasizing this point because it becomes very uh, crucial, as I'll return to, for thinking about our, our uh, present and this process of disavowal. This colonial blind spot conceals the humanity of those that it dominates, enslaves, colonizes, creates an ideology around them, 
and as a result creates a very paradoxical blindness in those who create the system. They are blind to the effects of their own creation. And what this looks like in practice is that you expect, if you create an entire system built on the inhumanity and the dehumanization of entire categories of people, you expect very little of them, much less something so human as to fight for freedom, so human as to fight for uh, uh, liberation, and so human as to fight for the ability, and here, of course, Haiti is the crucial example, to reorganize a society along uh, new lines. In other words, this colonial blind, sub, blind spot conceals skills, capacities, uh, advantages that I refer to then in the text unfolding this sort of conceptual uh, bundle as the second sight of the colonized. Here following Du Bois uh, in particular, but thinking of second sight as being something far beyond vision, right? It speaks of vision in certain ways. It speaks of modes of resistance, uh, advantages built right into the system of oppression, into the blindness that it creates. That, of course, being the main advantage, right? Using that blindness, using those shadows as a kind of invisibility cloak, allowing for resistance to develop unnoticed. Here, when we're thinking about the uh, second side of the colonized, I, I refer uh, and, and discuss what is, I mean, if you haven't seen this film, you should go watch it as quickly as you can, which is The, the Spook Who Sat By The Door, which is this sort of classic film about uh, revolutionary black resistance in the US, whose basic premise is about the sort of first black CIA official who then uses the skills learned um, and developed uh, to start a guerrilla war in Detroit. What's very interesting about the film is that it was essentially blacklisted. Nixon and the FBI sought to sort of bully even uh, you know, theaters you know, into not carrying it. And so this film itself was sort of pushed into that underground. Um, to the point where the, you know, the, the author and filmmaker was selling it out of the back of his uh, car. But what's essential about this film is that um, it's about the ways in which that blindness on the part of, the, of a sort of the white power structure and the colonizer is used, is weaponized, is turned into uh, you know, a weapon of resistance. And you know, Sam Greenlee, who, who made the film, wrote the book, um, he's very explicit about this. Um, and he even compared it and contrasted it, in fact, to an entire tradition of sort of black literature that focused on uh, the question of invisibility, specifically Ellison's Invisible Man. Uh, and, and I think he's a little unfair, but from his perspective, um, when Ellison wrote Invisible Man, he aspired to visibility, right? He diagnosed the invisibilization of, of black Americans and sought to break out of that invisibil invisibilization into visibility. Um, I think that's a complicated uh, claim, but um, it's very clear what Greenlee himself wanted to do with the spook who sat by the door, right? Which was to refuse that visibility, right? He said, we don't want to be seen. We want to use that invisibility as a weapon to fight back uh, against the system. And here I think his point, the interview was given only a few years ago, was also to push back very much on politics of visibility and representation that we are uh, sort of experiencing today. And to say there's something about that invisibilization, about the use and the utilization of that invisibility as a weapon that he wants to uh, preserve. Finally, if we're talking about the colonial blind spot is, is uh, sort of harboring this second sight, these modes of resistance, whether it's sort of slave resistance, you know, when I talk uh, uh, about, um, you know, about Harriet Tubman as someone who, carried all of these skills simultaneously in a really sort of radical and profound way. I talk about the sort of double second sight of, uh, of women in particular who used not only um, sort of racial and colonial condition, but also domestic condition as a way to, say, burn down uh, master's houses, right? Smuggle weapons, steal weapons, infiltrate uh, territories that they couldn't uh, have otherwise. There's an entire amazing history of, of black women who are infiltrating the Confederacy as housekeepers for the Confederate Four, including for um, Jefferson Davis, memorizing plans that they see, smuggling those out, and, and bringing them to the, the, the sort of Union side. The outgrowth of this second site in the context of the colonial blind spot is what I refer to as the decolonial ambush. It's that moment of eruption. It's the explosion. It's the shock that that explosion produces. And here, I think it's very important to return to Fanon, for whom... Um, we need to understand that the shock that greets the eruption and the explosion is in some ways a necessary 
um, ingredient. Not only is it something that we can use to diagnose the kind of blind, blindness of those in power, um, but Fanon, the question that Fanon would raise is, were it not for the shock, things don't enter into motion, right? The process of uh, escaping the zone of non-being explosively, eruptively, coming into visibility, demanding space, demanding that visibility in a revolutionary way, must create a shock, must create shock waves, um, you know, uh, if we're, if we're going to talk about the world being shifted. And, and of course, again, here we're talking about mass rebellion. We're talking about Ferguson. We're talking about Baltimore and Minneapolis, um, where despite all of the kind of liberal narratives about, you know, nonviolence and, and other questions, um, it's precisely the disruptiveness and the, um, the sort of ultimatum that these moments of eruption pose in other words, things change or this will continue. Things change or rebellion will get more serious um, and the methods will change and become uh, sort of uh, correspondingly more serious as well. It, without that shock, things are not set into motion. Without that shock, we are not talking about defunding today. Without that shock, abolition is not part of the mainstream conversation, right? We're not talking about abolition, abolishing the police, abolishing prisons, because people asked nicely because they wrote letters to their Congress, because they vote in elections? No. It's because, and, and it emerges very quickly when these rebellions occur. You can see, you can look at public opinion. And the shift around Minneapolis in public opinion around policing and recognition of the, the fundamental racial character of American policing shifted in an unprecedented way in the aftermath of Minneapolis. Something like 20 percentage points among white Americans. You saw something very similar in the 60s and 70s um, and, and while that's not permanent, it's a measure and a metric of the importance of that shock, of that uh, eruption. I speak at the end of the book, uh, you know, I, I turn to the, the sort of metaphor of the, the mole as a figure for thinking through underground uh, resistance. Um, you know, if I talked about Spooku Sat by the Door, I also talk about, you know, more contemporary films like Parasite and Us. If people haven't seen Us, I don't want to spoil it. Jordan Peele's Us. Um, but it's explicitly uh, a film about underground resistance, about what happens when the sort of wretched of the earth sort of invert the world um, and the last become first in a powerfully kind of monstrous way. Um, I talk about Venezuela, I mean, I almost said Venezuela. I talk about Venezuelan resistance, which I already mentioned. I talk about Vietnamese tunnels and the incredible ways in which, um, you know, I, again, it's like both a concrete reality historically, but also as a powerful metaphor. U.S. troops set up entire bases in Vietnam and didn't realize that there was an entire city that existed underneath them. And resistance fighters would emerge and carry out surprise attacks and then retreat underground. And the U.S. Army had no idea what was going on. And what did a U.S. general say at the time? He said, we set up our base on top of a volcano. And we didn't even know it, right? Um, and it's all to speak to the power of that resistance and the, the, you know, and the surprise that it evokes. Now, thinking, and I'm almost finished with my spiel, and then we can talk about whatever wants to talk about. Um, but thinking these two in conjunction with each other again, um, it, and thinking, uh, of course, in the context of where we are this weekend, um, draws out what I should say is one of the major unanswered questions of this book in particular, um, of both of them, really, um, which is what happens after the eruption, right? What happens as the sort of lava flows cool, as the landscape is reshaped, um, but, you know, more concretely speaking, after, if we're thinking about the sort of colonial blind spot, after the invisibility has been sort of in a certain way fractured, a level of visibility has been accomplished. I mean, again, we know we're talking about abolition. We know why Minneapolis exploded our world in a certain sense. What do we do now? And is that visibility a permanent feature or is it something that then is reconfigured um, by, uh, by counterinsurgency? We've spent two and a half years in counterinsurgency now in which, you know, first in Minneapolis and then nationwide, every array of political and media leaders have been trying to convince us that abolition is not the answer, that defunding even is too radical. You know, the things that every Democratic candidate in the last presidential election minus one 
was talking about defunding the police. They all were. Not that we should trust them, not that we should have believed that they would, but there's a reason that they were talking in those terms. Of course, we fucking elected the one that wasn't, and, uh, and, and here we are. But even today, when we hear Joe Biden talking about refunding the police, we should hear in his words the power of the streets, right? He's only talking about that because he has to. He's only talking about it because of the power and the danger to him of the demand to abolish uh, and defund the police. So what do we do with this new visibility, right? Does the metaphor of the volcano and of the eruption hold up in a context in which everyone knows what's going on? People are talking about it and people are trying to repress that conversation in which we're being told to sort of chasten our demands and our, uh, the ambitiousness of our, uh, of our abolitionist claims. And this is why I was emphasizing this question of disavowal earlier, about the ways in which the colonial blind spot throughout history reappears and becomes stronger and then weaker, and there's then sort of like moments of clear visibility give rise to even greater attempts to repress that knowledge and disavow it. And this is why, in reality, the colonial blind spot persists. This is why I started by saying the eruption, if not today, then tomorrow, then the next, the next year, then the year after that. Because this is a system that requires and demands the hyper-exploitation of poor people, the uh, segmentation of those poor into racialized categories that have become even more invisible, dehumanized, hyper-exploitable, the material conditions, in other words, require a doubling down on that blindness, require the, uh, the sort of disavowal of our understanding of what led to the last explosion. And that's what's happening today. That's what's happening even as we talk in the aftermath of the visibility provoked by the eruption in Minneapolis, even as all of the media yesterday was preparing us for a rebellion last night, there's a blindness built into that. There's an active disavowal built into that. And over time, what happens is the reconfiguration of new conditions for, for eruption uh, and for explosion. And I think that's where we're, we're at today. So I look forward to having a conversation with you all about this, seeing you know, what questions um, you have about these two books, about anything, about everything. Um, and uh, thank you all very much. Awesome, yeah. Peace. Um, I'm not really quite sure how to frame it as a question, but like the uh, just the idea of the colonial blind spot, it immediately brings to mind like a FBI correspondence uh, where they were, uh, I think it's between like a psychiatrist who's evaluating the uh, ex Black Panther, ex uh, Black Liberation Army, Panther 21 guy, Daruba uh, Ben Wahad, while he's in prison. Um, and the correspondence is internal correspondence between this uh, psychiatrist and the FBI. Uh, and he kind of begins, it speaks to an underestimation because he, he begins by like kind of like going like, man, I'm speaking to this guy. He's, um, you know, he really strikes me as like intelligent, charismatic, very educated. He knows what he's talking about. Um, and I want to say he even went as far as to be like, he kind of felt himself being swayed, uh, persuaded. Uh, and then he ends it by saying, this is the type of person that, this is in like the late 80s. He's like, this is the type of person that, whose life story could be watered down by like an HBO special. And um, Basically, the object of the, the memo was to say, like, we need to get this guy out of this particular prison and kind of shuffle him around. Um, I don't know. I'm not really quite sure how to frame it as a question, but, like, that was what immediately came to mind when you talk about this blind spot and this underestimation. And now it's like that last line about the HBO special, it kind of speaks to, like, the there is an awareness of their own ignorance and now a need to like subvert it in very sophisticated ways through the media, um, you know, 
these people whose whose theory is very strong and who are very persuasive and very intelligent um and have could have strong impact on like the prison population lead to Atticas and uh so forth um yeah no I'm not I'm, I don't know if that's really a question but it it just for the sake of conversation it did come to mind no, oh, I appreciate that. I thought you were going to say something about Judas and the Black Messiah too, because there were these critiques of the film, right, as being this yeah. kind of watered down. I don't, I don't know that I'm on board with those critiques all the way, right? Because it was also a powerful film that showed both the sort of acuity of counterinsurgent methods, but also their their failures, right? Also their 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 own blind spots, their inability to actually grasp what was going on. And one of the main, well, not one of the main, but a sharp critique that was levied at this book in particular. Was uh, was sort of like came through that lens of counterinsurgency, right? And said, you know, listen, they're not blind. The CIA is not blind. They're not this. They're not that. And, and I think there's a truth to that. Um, uh, but I also think that there is. I mean, and you can look at the history of counterinsurgency doctrine and the way that it's formulated and the way that it's framed. And it's also constantly trying to keep up with yeah. these undefeatable movements, right? The whole point of insurgency and guerrilla warfare in particular is that it's a movement of uh, ostensibly weak and poorly armed people that suddenly shows the capacity to defeat heavily armed you know, uh, units, right? Why? Invisibility, right? If you read Vietnamese military doctrine about Dien Bien Phu when they defeated the French, Again, this is when the tunnels are developing, right? And they learn tunneling also from, you know, from, uh, you know, Korean tunnelers. Um, and they use that invisibility in ways that prevents the heavy technology from grasping what's happening, right? Um, and, and, of course, there are ways in which um, all of this plays out in terms of the U.S. counterinsurgent efforts. The... FBI was obsessed with the Panthers, was obsessed with the Black Liberation Movement. But that obsession, of course, carried with it certain blind spots, like that they don't really have support, that, um, you know, the old narrative of outside agitators, that there's got to be sort of like um, someone getting these, you know, like ideas into the heads, you know, uh, of these people and of the community. And so if we take out those leaders, then we are able to defeat the movement, right? It's devastatingly effective in certain ways, but of course doesn't destroy the conditions, that the FBI exists to uphold and preserve, right? Which is racialized, brutal super exploitation. And again, like the more that we, I have conversations about the, the book, I just, the more I come back to there's that material foundation of this, right? Why does white supremacy exist? To uphold capitalist exploitation, without which, I mean, uh, sort of, and, and without the, you know, the white supremacy is a powerful tool for that uh, hyper exploitation. Um, other tools and other mechanisms are required. The system's not willing to give up on that. It's trying to reconfigure it now into sort of like a, a sort of kind of multiracial uh, quasi ruling class that upholds uh, the same uh, power structure that sacrifices and abandons sort of 80% of communities of color, if not more, 90, 95%, um, while promoting, you know, some that, of course, leads to a situation in which the police, the Memphis Police Department is 58% black, right? And is sent onto the streets to do the exact same work as any white police department, right? Which is to brutalize, to stamp out crime. They talk about, uh, you know, which policies were violated, et cetera, when they know the function of this scorpion unit was to be carried out and to get a, and to get results, right? There can be all the policies in the world, all the guidelines in the world, all the training in the world, but the goal and the function of this unit, anti-crime unit, was to police and sort of harass uh, the poorest among the Memphis black community. Um, and this is the inevitable result of that. That's why Fanon said, right, there's no, and he was writing in the context of the Algerian war, and he said, torture is no accident under this system. Torture is the inevitable result of a system of uh, racial disqualification, right? And again, racial disqualification as a material economic function, which can't be just, you know, it's not that, that there's just bad ideas that are racist, and you get rid of them, and then capitalism can continue, right? No, no, they're part of that system, right? Yeah. Hello. Oh, there we go. Okay. Sorry. Um, thanks. That was that was really fascinating. I'm doing a lot of work on anti-colonial like solidarity, 
Um, and I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about this figure of the mole that you're kind of, which I'm reading as a sort of analytic for understanding how the subjugated are weaponizing this colonial blind spot, right? Um, but I'm interested in the function of the mole and how it fits into the sort of afterlives of these eruptions, right? In the and how how the f this this figure or maybe this figure this is the limit of of the figure's use in in thinking through the stuff um, about shaping a new and having a sort of positive vision for the sort of the afterlife of the sort of decolonial uh, explosion. No, that's a great question. Um, and you probably know, I mean, the mole has this long, really interesting history, right? Um, there's all these references. Um, there's references in Marx to the old mole, well-grubbed old mole, and you're like, well, what does that come from? And Hegel mentions it, well-grubbed old mole. You go back, and it's from Shakespeare, and it's like Hamlet's father, who's like a ghost, but like under the stage, right? That's the old mole. He's like floating around invisibly under the stage. Um, the Vietnamese were also described as an army of moles, right? I mean, for, for good reason. Um, they were sort of tunneling underground. Um, you know, you can read into that, you know, and there's this whole sort of almost cosmology of the earth as a protector and a shelterer. And I talk about, I talk about drone warfare. I talk about the idea, and there's this sort of very dystopian idea that drone warfare creates pure visibility um, and it reaches a certain pure point of... Uh, it's a long, you know, it's a lo sort of long argument about sort of... Um, Artillery, um, the point of artillery, right, in the development um, is to create, is to inflict more harm with less and less risk at greater and greater distance, right? Um, and so there's this argument that, that drones create the, the sort of perfect zero risk, you know, you know pure effect, pure visibility. Um, and I think Vietnam really disproves a lot of that, right? In the sense that there's this below the surface, there's the just there's sort of depth that can be leveraged in that sense. The debates about the mole, though, and this gets to the Marx and Hegel stuff, right, is it's traditionally understood that the mole is creating the basis for the revolution that then breaks ground, right? Um, in other words, it's read in a kind of teleological way, um, pointing toward a certain future, again, in this kind of Hegelian cunning sense of an inevitable uh, revolution that looks a certain kind of way that is being created, that has a linear kind of quality. But there are readings, I think, that cut radically against that, right? Which emphasize the mole as preparing and the preparation being a greater prefigurative part of what that revolution looks like, right? And here I, I you sort of draw on people like Nick Estes, who, you know, reads the mole in sort of indigenous revolutionary theory as, as precisely that, as doing that work, right? He talks about the mole work at Standing Rock, which creates the basis or the continuation of that struggle. If you think about Ferguson, for people that remember, what was striking about Ferguson was its duration. Weeks, like nonstop rebellion for weeks, uh, in which people who had never protested before showed up, set up tables and put out food and put out water and did that kind of mole work that creates the basis for a new society in the process of rebellion. Um, and, and, you know, in indigenous theory, the mole is also something very different as well. It's sort of medicinal. The, you know, the mole hills coexist with roots, coexist with, you know, all these other uh, uh, capacities. And so there's a very different way to read the mole, right? Mm -hmm. That leans toward the prefigurative, that refuses the teleological, that's always creating, and this gets, I think, to your question, right? Always creating the ground for the next explosion, right? Even if we don't know when, if we don't know how, even if it's not predictable. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Asantua Nkrumah Ture. My hey, pronouns are, hey, hey, happy new year. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and co-conspirator. Um, first of all, to your comment about Jeruba Ben Wahad, he's still a sharp brother. And if you've seen his um, interviews and commentary on YouTube in the last year or so, he's still on point. Um, so definitely follow him if you can on YouTube and uh, I'm with Black Alliance for Peace, and we do have him join with us on conversations from time to time. So in spite of what he went through, he and his family, granted he was wounded, if you know what I mean, but at the same time, whatever resources he had, internal and external, they kept him at a place and at a point where he could still contribute to our struggle. So um, there's that. 
um, regarding policing, what I'm looking at now, and I'm not sure we're ready for, is the class struggle among African people. You know, all skin folk and kin folk, that's Atlanta. That's uh, Memphis and some other places, right? Even Philadelphia. So I think there's, there's going to be a level of class struggle among us that is going to get messy. You know, every time the anti-war movement really peaks up and then people in public or on social media, whatever, say, oh, well, yeah, I agree. I don't like the military. I don't like the police, but that's how my parents bought a house. That's how my parents sent me to college and I didn't have to have a student loan. Yeah, that's true. But now you know the contradiction. Now where does that go? Where does that go? And then here come Reverend Warnock and all of them. They're going to pray for the, the, the comrade we lost uh, protesting Cobb City. Well, I pray too, but I'm not sure we pray to the same God. Right? We need to prepare ourselves for that. We need to prepare ourselves for black folks walking around call it, sounding like the White Citizens Council talking about all these white outsiders. Are you kidding me? Are we prepared for that? Are we in an organization where we can deal with that? When your grandmama come to you and say, baby, are you going to church? And you say, no, I'm going to a meeting. Right? When your favorite aunt says, you know, retire from the military, and she's living in a nice little house or whatever, but then now what? Those are some real issues we have to struggle with. And our, com our non-black comrades, y'all going to have to struggle with that too. Don't, don't, don't sleep on that. So that's, that's what I'm concerned with right now. Uh, we had a meeting this morning, and we're struggling with that because people are, people are really dealing with this. Thank you, comrade. Yeah, no, I mean, of course. There was black cops in Philly in 1890, <laughs> right? And so, like, there's moments where I'm like, oh, of course, like, clearly we're going to get beyond this, right? Clearly we're, and, and I think it's true, right? I think Memphis will help elevate us to a, a higher level of consciousness when it comes to these things because it's very undeniable, right? But then again, you would have said Baltimore should have done that too. But it's very easy to fall back because Ferguson is happening. Ferguson is like white Jim Crow police brutality, right? It's very, very sort of like classic picture. Um, and it's easy to fall back on that framework, right? Um, and the need is to really, truly understand this as institutional and systemic, right? And this is not to excuse the individuals involved, right? But honestly, like it, maybe it's better that we excuse the individuals involved if we can target the system, right? By understanding the ways in which it does not matter who you are if you're put into that function, that's what's expected of you. All of the data shows this. All of the data shows that, um, that black cops, brown cops, women are expected to be, yeah, are expected to be more violent because they have to prove themselves in a function that they're put out there to do. Again, this was an elite unit. One of the excuses we're going to see is, and this is, I mean, it's very difficult, right? I agree with the push to abolish scorpion units, 100%. At the same time, we can't find that as an excuse because though they're an expression of something that's already in the rest of the units, right? Um, and, and so it's a dangerous sort of like reform that's being posed right now that is not going to deal with uh, these questions. Um, but they are, again, put out there to perform a function. If they don't perform it, they'll be replaced by someone else who will perform it, right? Um, and so the reality is that there's no way, again, there's no way out of this with piecemeal reform. There's no way out of, out of it without dismantling uh, these structures. And you're absolutely right. These are democratically governed cities, right? And so we get all this sympathy from, from uh, elected leaders, um, but we get much less in terms of material solidarity for these struggles, right? Um, and we need to be asking ourselves, why does a scorpion unit exist in the city of Memphis? Who, who is it there to police? What communities? Um, why are they building Cop City in Atlanta? Why are they building an entire training center for new forms of violence, new forms of counterinsurgency? Um, and it's because the police have always been counterinsurgent, right? A scorpion union is not just about uh, protecting property, which it definitely is, but it's about a counterinsurgency geared at the poorest of the poor, um, as a permanent threat to the stability of, uh, you know, of this system.
Thank you so much. Um, is this, can you hear me? I mean, is it on? Um, I was thinking about, you had mentioned the term like outside agitators pretty constantly and it, um, and you know, we saw that from, you know, recently like Eric Adams talking about outside agitators last night, but also we have that in, you know, in Latin America where the Peruvian government just banned Evo Morales from Peru, um, saying that his involvement in, air, in the highland areas of Peru um, was outside agitating um, indigenous Quechua people there. And so I was wondering if you could talk kind of more across the Americas about this, like how different people have confronted um, the use of the term outside agitator and challenge that um, in the work that you've done in the world in police and anti-colonial eruptions? That's a great question. Um, the, so outside agitator tropes go all the way back, right? You find them in conversations about slave insurrections, right? Back in the late 1700s, early 1800s. Um, and it's, in all, it's all part of trying to manage that cognitive dissonance, right? Which is to say, you know, our slaves are happy, but there are slave rebellions that we're, we're afraid of. How do we manage this, right? How do we explain it, right? How do we explain it away? And one easy way to explain it away is to blame it on someone else, right? To blame it on, you know, uh, you know, whether it was in the aftermath of the Civil War, sort of carpetbaggers and others, or whether it's, you know, the civil rights movement with sort of white students, you know, and freedom riders, um, or whether in the case of, of earlier uh, examples, it's, you know, the, the example of Haiti, it's the example of sort of even the, the Jacobins, right, as this sort of like fearful... Um, you know, fearful uh, rebels. This is references to like the Jacobins of America, right? As those people who are sort of like untrustworthy, sort of like uh, rebels. Um, and and so that trope is always there, right? Um, I first, I, and of course, it was a huge element of clan discourse. Um, I like the way you connected to Latin America because it's a reminder that, and I was thinking about a. Uh, uh, Travis Lineman wrote this great book recently called The Horror of Police, right? And he talks about horror and terror as affects and, and the way that horror and terror are central to like police films and the way that, you know, the police are figured, you know, uh, in, in sort of pop culture. But one thing that it raised for me was this idea of white terror, right? Which of course evokes white supremacist violence and lynching and all of that, right? But also white terror as a long-term historical reference point to anti-communist violence, right? White terror against all communist revolutions, the torture, the murder, the disappearance, going back to, you know, you know the 1920s and, and beyond. Um, and so think about the connection between those two is key, right? Because the Klan was doing the same thing, right? They're talking about outside agitators and communists and communist meetings and warning black people not to go to communist meetings. Of course, communists are the people organizing uh, among, uh, you know, sharecroppers organizing the working class in the South at the time. And so it's a real twin threat to this system of power that's being uh, addressed and confronted. I first confronted the outside agitator stuff personally in Oakland around, you know, the murder of Oscar Grant. When Oscar Grant was killed, immediately there were mass rebellions. The, the sort of constituency of these rebellions were sort of 18 to 20 year old black men in particular who were taking over the street, resisting, rebelling, fighting. And very quickly, the police department fed to the media, who fed to sort of other communities, so-called community leaders, the idea that this was being led by outside agitators, implicitly white, right? And it's been a staple of every single rebellion ever since. And I think it's losing a bit of its traction, right? And I think one of the best ways to confront that is to say, of course, like, we're, we're all outside agitator. So like, that's like the essence of an ethical relationship with the world is that if there's an injustice in Memphis, we care about it, right? Because yeah, the implication is like you shouldn't care about police murder unless you live in the city where it just happened most recently. It's a bizarre logic, right? And so I think the best way to sort of explode through that is to sort of reject it, refuse it, denounce it, and, and uh, you know, and to fight that kind of um, ideological battle. But yeah, it dovetails very cleanly with the way that socialist revolution across Latin America is figured, right? And the sort of 
uh, you know, the threat that someone like Hugo Chavez posed as the sort of figure looming over Latin America. Um, and we talk a lot of times about the, the sort of uh, Cold War logic of the, of the Soviet beachhead in Latin America, because this is what, um, you know, Nixon through Reagan are kind of thinking about, right? Like if the Soviets get a socialist foothold in Latin America, that's a risk to us. But that's a very dehumanizing vision for those who have been fighting for decades and centuries in Latin America for socialist sort of like uh, systems and equality um, because it wasn't, again, the outside agitators in the Soviet Union that were trying to build that, but it was people uh, sort of um, on the ground. Um, and yet this is, again, what fuels coups, dictatorships, disappearances, you know, Operation Condor. This is what fuels the disappearance of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people from Guatemala to Argentina and, and, and Chile. Um, and it's a, a really brutal anti-communism, right? It's less overtly about white supremacy there. Of course, we know it's radically anti-black and anti-indigenous. It's more, it's like very similar to what we go through, but like, like you know, uh, explicitly at least, much more about saving the country from communism, right? If we think of someone like Bolsonaro, who luckily was just ousted in Brazil and hopefully, hopefully will die from the long-term effects of his kitchen knife wound uh, eventually in, in Miami, which would be fitting. Um, yeah, Orlando, even worse, wow. Um, Jesus. Uh, he openly praised the Brazilian dictatorship for saving the country from communism, right? And here's someone who's obliterating everything that's good about the country, right? Destroying the Amazon, breaking up indigenous communities, allowing sort of clear cutting, um, and of course, letting the police, and this is crucial, letting the police do whatever they want. And this is a police force that already kills 5,000 people a year, something like that. Um, like per capita, Brazil has probably the most murderous police in the world outside of maybe South Africa. And it's, it's uh, you know, much higher than, than in the U.S. Um, and so that's all tied together, right? Um, yeah. I like what you said about, uh, I like what you said about South Africa, Dr. George, because in South Africa now, the squatters movement, like we do here in the U.S., we took over we have takeover houses people are living in because they're owned by the city or HUD and they don't fix them up. People take them over and they live in them. Right now that's going on in South Africa. It's called a squatters movement. And we really get to see policing as an institution and it does not matter where it is. It does not matter if the ANC is in power in the government or what have you. You know, we still have a thing. My other question to you, though, is regarding policing, and this is something I'm struggling with and struggling with other comrades. You know, yes, we're against police, but to maintain our own safety, particularly in our movement spaces, it's going to require a higher level of organizational discipline that I don't think we're ready to imagine. We had a disruption at our MLK anti-war event last Friday night where the person disrupted our event because they had a problem with one person who was supposed to be a speaker and that speak person did not come, so that should have been the end of it. Nonetheless, none of us there plan to call the police, but suppose someone who's not accustomed to these kind of politics, seeing that, and a lot of people, a lot of young people are traumatized because they've seen violence and fights and so forth. Suppose someone not a part of our movement uh, called the police and the police came, and then that endangered all of us. Reminiscent of the UCLA in 1969, the Panthers and et cetera. We, we, have, we have those kind of issues to deal with. I'm all for cutting the budget of the police department, but if you live in a small community in a rural area, and there's been sexual assaults and rapes, and the lab, in terms of forensics or whatever you call it, doesn't have enough funding to do those tests, now what? So those are, those are some layers of this that I hope we deal with as well. Yeah, no, thank you. That's a great question. It's a, it's a really good question that, in a way, the South Africa piece opens up onto, right, in, in very interesting ways, right? Again, if we're talking about somewhere where uh, the idea, the simple idea of black rule as a solution to problems, South Africa is a great counterexample, right? Um, nothing has changed. Very little has changed, right? Um, and on the one hand, it's something that we share very clearly here, which is a failure of transition in the sense of the failures of reconstruction in the U.S., right? We need to finish 
Reconstruction. Shit, we need to finish Sherman's March and then finish Reconstruction. Um, but South Africa, right, was an explicitly truncated process of truth and reconciliation in which reconciliation came before structural change, right? So you have black rule and very little else, right? Um, hand in hand with an explicit strategy by the ANC to disempower more revolutionary elements, right? And here, you know, I'm getting sort of to the point, which is that there were and there persisted um, even under and as a part of the ANC what were called street committees, local, grassroots, self-defense organizations, popular courts, um, run in and by poor communities, right? In which they kept each other safe, kept themselves safe, and made decisions about how to uh, administer justice um, where, they, um, where they lived. Those became viewed as a threat to the ANC and were pushed aside and were disempowered, right? Those are the kind of institutions and organizations and organs that need to exist. Yes, of course. Of course you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so those are the kind of organizations that need to exist today, right? And I think it's very important to understand that and part of what I try to do in the police book is to insist that in this moment where huge numbers of people have been brought into the cause of abolition, um, we're in a moment where certain kind of hashing out needs to happen, right? Certain clarifications need to emerge. Um, and, and one of them is around self-defense, right? Some of, you know, like our sort of old heads of abolition, the people that we all love and respect, and Ruthie and, and, and you know, Robin Kelly and Angela Davis, they all know perfectly well that the history of black struggle in the U.S. and beyond is a history of self-defense, right? They all participate in these movements. They know very well about them. They know the history of them. But when you bring hundreds of thousands of people into a movement, um, all of a sudden you have to engage in some of that clarification and some of that sort of political education. Because there's a certain idealistic vision that says if we remove the police from a community, the community is prepared to sort of just sort of exist without them, right? No, the communities that we live in are communities that are structured and created and built in a certain kind of way, premised upon capital and the police and individualism and all of these things, right? Um, and those collective structures need to be get built, and those collective structures need to be able to keep people safe. And, and, and I sort of, uh, you know, belabor the point a little bit because I think it, it, it's seen by a certain sector of maybe abolitionism as creating a new state or creating a new police or creating... No, we're talking about something very different. We're talking about keeping each other safe in community, in conversation, in grassroots democracy, um, you know, with, you know, with our, uh, our neighbors. And that's a very different thing. But we need to be very realistic about the fact that, like, if we're in West Philadelphia, I mean, this is also a sort of political organizing question, right? Because you're not going to, you know, like, walk around and talk to your neighbors and tell them we're just getting rid of the police and nothing, nothing else is going to exist in their place, right? Like, we're not going to build community and build safety and build, you know, uh, institutions of self-defense, right? No, we need those things. Right? They need to be built. We need to think about rapid response networks, about self-defense networks. We need to think about the ways in which people don't call the police. I mean, people right now, people call the police not because they have an ideological, uh, they're making an ideological mistake whereby they think they have no alternatives, right? I don't know if I'm being clear. The reality is that people have no alternatives, right? Like we live in a world that materially is built so that there are no alternatives to the police, right? So again, it's not simply that people have to correct the way they think. We have to rebuild the world in a way that will make those alternatives present. Right? Should we go? Yeah. I guess this is more of just like a thought based off of what folks have shared and like just trying to think back to some of my experiences in organizing too and like these eruptions that you're talking about and... Um, I think I used to think when I first came into abolitionism that like the prison was kind of like the last horizon for anti-blackness. But I feel like I'm not confident that if we abolished prisons and abolished the police today, which I still think we should do, I'm not confident that anti-blackness would be abolished by those things. And so I'm curious as to like, it feels like the horizon keeps getting further and further. It's like, okay, maybe it's the border or maybe it's the state. But because anti-blackness is so embedded beyond these institutions, it feels like the institutions are just the how, but not necessarily like the what. The institutions are just how anti-blackness runs, but it's not the logic of anti-blackness. And so I'm just curious, just thinking about like all these iterations of eruptions that maybe 
take down one system, but then the next system is still there and anti-blackness is still there. Like what, like what now, <laughs> I guess, or what, what then, I guess we're not even in the now yet, but what then? That's such a good question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think one of the things we confront is that abolition and it's something that, you know, people talk about it a lot and it needs to be sort of reiterated even if it's not in the form of an answer, which is to say that like abolition needs to become real in the world, even though it's this distant absolute horizon, right? The ways that it becomes real are partial. And then every time a partial change comes about, there's an attempt to reinstitute and reconstitute the prior system, right? Um, this is why there's so much continuity in U.S. history, right? Which is that you abolish slavery, you have convict leasing, you have prisons, you have the racialization of crime, the criminalization of race, and you have mass incarceration and hyper-policing, right? This is because of that sort of attempt, partial attempt, right? So how, do we, how is it that we make partial changes while building toward an abolitionist horizon that, you know, uh, you know, that, you know overcomes these challenges whereby anti-black logics uh, re, uh, re-emerge? I think the ultimately, I believe um, that anti-blackness is upheld institutionally and materially. Um, and I say that for a couple of reasons. I'm not saying it very confidently, but I say it for a couple of reasons. One is that it shifts, it's shifted so much over time. If you look at, um, I mean, I think the black Jacobins, by C.L.R. James is a good example where he's kind of trying to track moments where racism retreats, moments where it's reinstituted, where the sort of, uh, you know, where it becomes, where racism becomes very convenient to, to, to double down on, and then there's moments where it has to be relinquished in certain ways, um, and, and shows a kind of mobility of it through uh, struggle. But we can also look at U.S. history, where until the late 1600s, um, the the constellation of, of racism and white supremacy looks very, very different. Um, and, um, of course, that was prior to these categories really being constituted, right? Whiteness as a thing wasn't really fully in existence prior to then. Um, and so maybe there's a one-way directionality where once it's there, it's really hard to dislodge. Um, but I, I do believe that it's upheld in institutions, right? Um, that doesn't make the answer any easier, right? Because there are all of the institutions of our world, right? So you've got like, of course, white, you know, white supremacy um, embedded in, you know, the state policing, um, you know, deeply intertwined with capitalism as a, you know, a mode of production um, and with patriarchy as an overarching and underlying sort of structure of domination. Um, and the question is always, how do you abolish these things all at once, right? Um, because, you know, and I think, so this is the daunting thing, right? I think anti-blackness is very hard to dislodge in this country in particular um, without really dramatically transforming all of those, right? Again, if the police are abolished tomorrow, we have private police the next day. Why? Because we live in a system that's governed by um, radical capitalist inequality and white supremacist fear, you know, and sort of libidinal domination, which is also patriarchal as well, right? Um, but Saying it that way it makes you realize that once those things are sort of pushed back, set into retreat through struggle, that there's the potential for you know a, a reconfiguration of what that looks like. Um, it's so daunting, and we just happen to live in like one of the most anti-black parts of an anti-black world, right? Um, where the specific structures were built starting in the 1700s to um, to reinforce, double down on that binary, and make it a governing you know logic. We have about like five, ten-ish minutes left. Any other questions, points to bring up? I have a question for you in the meantime, yeah. Um, so let me pull myself for a second. Um, so I navigate a lot of spaces um, where conversations about um, being an abolitionist or defunding the police kind of gets a little bit testy. Like I work in corporate America and my job sometimes is to have those discussions with folks about like what is it or explain it. So I guess my question to you is a little bit more like how do you approach those conversations with people who have like 
no idea about this. Or as soon as you say abolish the police, they're just like, well, who's going to protect us anymore, right? Like, what's that, that counter narrative that people always push? Like, and even also in the sense of anti-colonialism as well, like, what are some of the kind of, I guess, how do we go out into the world and talk to the naysayers or the people who just are not in this space that we navigate um, to bring them along this journey with us? That's a great question. It's not easy, of course. And I think, but I think there's always ways, uh, you know, to have these conversations. And we sort of touched on it earlier when we were talking about how you have a conversation with someone in West Philly who is worried about danger and harm, right? Like things that really exist um, in the community, which we're seeing sort of dramatically. How do you deal with a context now in which there's this sort of panic about gun crime, which is being sort of blamed on abolition and defunding, which is a lie, right? There's been no defunding. There's been no, uh, you know, no abolition, of course. Um, and so those questions, I think, you know, you always kind of start, I think, where, where those questions are raised, right? Like, I think a lot of people, which is to say, I think a lot of people know that the police don't really help them, don't really keep them any safer, but again, also know that they don't have anyone else to call. And so, you know, and I often talk about, I often talk about this, so sort of forgive me if you've heard it, but one time organizing in Oakland, an old comrade, former Black Panther, he's just like berating this like young black woman for like saying that she would call the police if she felt like she was at, in danger, right? And it struck me as the sort of the weirdest thing, both sort of like, you know, I mean, just both kind of ethically, but also just politically, like you're going to blame someone who has no alternative in a very dangerous world for that, right? Um, but the question of how to have these conversations, I think, goes far beyond that. I mean, I grew up in like white country, um, and I think that always is where I think about these conversations happening. And there are so many different ways to have these conversations. I remember a long time ago... Um, my dad was asking about Palestine. He was like, I don't really get, like, why are they fighting like this? Why are they? And I was just like, well, what if someone just, like, came over here and, like, took all your shit and, like, took your land and, like, told you you had to go live somewhere else? And he was like, oh, well, yeah. Like, of course I would fight back. You know what I mean? Like, but also, like, there's plenty of ways. And again, like, there's lots of ways in which, um, in which the, this raises a lot of questions, right, about the white working class, the poor whites and whatever. But there's lots of leverage points to have these conversations, right? No one, I don't say no one, but there are a lot of people who are not getting along well in this system. Um, there are ways that they've been sort of uh, either bought off or sort of indoctrinated into believing that their best hope is someone like Trump, um, when in reality, um, some of those same communities might be some of the quickest to be on board with more radical uh, struggles than, say, like urban, middle-class, white communities or something like that. Um, and, and I think tapping into those through conversations about self-defense, for example, conversations about gun culture and what it means to have like a revolutionary gun culture as opposed to what we live in, you know, uh, today. Um, I think these are all different like ways of beginning where people are at, understanding that, that every consciousness is divided, potentially has a revolutionary element that you can grab onto and sort of push in the right direction. I'm not sure that corporate America is a place that you're going to find much of that, but like, uh, I mean... No, uh, thank you so much for that. I also so I, I identify I'm biracial as well, so half black, half white. So it's interesting this conversation around defunding the police, because it's like you know my white side of my family that's like, oh well, you know we can't defund the police, but then they're also the first people who are like, don't call the police if something happens on my property, right? Like so it's so wild to me as much as they want to protect the police, they're also not the ones to call either. Um, I've I've been on my black side of my family that like you don't call the police there, and I'm like on the white side I don't call the police either. So it's like why are we funding the police? Don't call the police, you know? right? And I think the question for people is like you, you all don't, like you don't want to call the police and people feel that way and people know that and so the question is tapping into maybe why right what is it that people already know about the world without even maybe consciously thinking about it thank you we can solve our own problems like this is part of it right like people take care of them. And, and i say this in the in the police book right which is that we all there there are ways and spaces in which we all take care of each other, know what that looks like, take care of family members, take care of neighbors, you know, they ask for help, we ask for help. That's all without the police, right? We don't need the police there to make sure that that's okay. When there's a conflict in your family, I hope you don't call the police, uh, maybe you do, but um, ho hopefully, like, you don't, and because you understand innately that there's a way to de-escalate and have a conversation about what's causing this behavior, how to, you know, uh, create a situation which it doesn't have to happen. Yeah. Great points. Thank you so much. Um, any other final questions, thoughts, kudos, amazing awesomeness, because Dio was fantastic. No? Okay. Uh, well, I guess we will round it out then. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Um,
as always, we're very thankful that y'all came out to support Making Worlds um, and also books for sale in the back. So please buy the books. Also, all these books on the shelves are for sale too. So buy those books too. Um, and you can always make donations to us or become a sustainer as well if you want to support us ongoingly and get some awesome perks and discounts and also all the fun benefits and things that come with that. Or you can volunteer with us too. So many ways to get involved and support us. So please do so. Um, thank you so much. And we'll hopefully see you again soon. Thank you.